Gwatsi Haupa. Hello again, tribal leaders, colleagues, and friends. We had a great morning to kick off the White House Tribal Nation Summit today. We heard directly from the president about this administration's all of government approach to ensure tribes have a seat at the decision making table and have input on the policies that impact all of their communities. Thank you all for joining this panel discussion on public safety. I want to thank each of you for putting the safety and health of your communities first, in particular during this pandemic. Your efforts protect our elders, our culture, and languages, and our traditions. The COVID-19 pandemic put a spotlight on the disparities in health that we experience, but also highlighted the lack of resources for public safety. In my first month as Secretary of the Interior, I launched our Missing and Murdered Unit to help put the full weight of the federal government into investigating these cases and martial law enforcement resources across federal agencies and throughout Indian country. I worked tirelessly in Congress to get the Not Invisible Act across the finish line, and now as Secretary, we are carefully implementing that law. In August, Interior and the Department of Justice opened the nomination process for our Not Invisible Act Task Force. I want to thank you all for helping our agencies find a qualified pool of candidates with diverse experiences to help inform this work as we move ahead on this critical piece that will help ensure our people will no longer go missing without a trace. As we all know, many of the barriers to native justice to justice native people face come in the form of lack of infrastructure. During today's public safety panel discussion, we want to hear directly from all of you about the challenges that you're experiencing, the lessons you've learned, and how we can support your public safety efforts. I know that through collaboration, smart investments, and with your input, we can find solutions that will keep native communities safe. We have a unique moment and platform to make sure our voices are heard. Let's make sure we take advantage of every single moment. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Interior's amazing solicitor, Bob Anderson, a fierce defender of indigenous people and an invaluable counselor to me and to the Department of the Interior. Bob. Thank you, Secretary Holland. Uh, as always, it's inspirational to hear from you, and uh, you're a fantastic leader, and we, we dearly uh, appreciate your uh, leadership and uh, uh, your inspiration to us. So today's panel uh, that I'm heading up uh, as a solicitor of the Department of the Interior deals with uh, public safety and justice in tribal communities. We've got a, we have a distinguished panel of speakers uh, coming to us directly from Indian country and two uh, distinguished uh, uh, cabinet members uh, from the Department of the Interior and the Department of Justice. Uh, as the Secretary said, I'm, I'm Bob Anderson, the Solicitor of the Department of the Interior, uh, and I'm a member of the Boys Fort Band of uh, Ojibwe uh, back in uh, Minnesota. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit, just, just to start with, before I introduce the uh, uh, panelists, about the fact that, you know, American Indian law and, and justice delivery system is exceedingly complex. Uh, our justice system operates based on laws that were passed in wildly different times. The first in 1815, uh, another one in 18, uh, 70, 1883, uh, and another one uh, in 1953, Public Law 280. And these complicated federal laws uh, have resulted in a, in a patchwork of jurisdiction within Indian country uh, that is difficult to navigate uh, for the federal government, for the tribes, and for the states. But at the bottom line, it's all about keeping our communities safe. Uh, there's nothing more important than being safe from uh, criminal violence, from sexual assault, uh, and from the uh, ravages of uh, drug and al alcohol abuse. And all of these things are tied up with the uh, criminal justice system, uh, and it's uh, an area that we are setting out to improve. And so this discussion today uh, will uh, kick off a, a national dialogue between the United States and Indian nations uh, to figure out ways to jointly uh, improve the situation. So let me start off uh, by introducing uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, Lisa Monaco to my right. 
she is the deputy AG, which means she's the uh, number two officer uh, within the Department of Justice. Uh, she supervises uh, the department, all of the U.S. attorneys, uh, and uh, it's a huge department. And so I'm very happy that uh, the Deputy Attorney General uh, Monaco is able to uh, join us today. On my left is Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, Brian Newland, uh, from the Bay Mills Indian Community. He's a Senate-confirmed um, uh, appointee, uh, has uh, done a prior gig uh, with the Biden administration, just as uh, uh, Attorney General uh, Monaco had, had done. Uh, on to our, our tribal panelists. Uh, first off is uh, Chair uh, uh, Janet Davis from the Pyramid Lake Band of Paiutes. She was elected as the chair of the tribe in December 2020. Uh, and before that, she has you know, been in grassroots politics, serving on the tribal council uh, and is a former chief judge of the Bay Mills, or of the, uh, uh, is on the Pyramid Lake High School uh, School Board. Whitney Gravel uh, is the uh, Bay Mills Indian Community President, and she is the one who served as the chief judge for the Bay Mills Tribal Court before joining uh, the uh, uh, leadership position at, at Bay Mills. Uh, she was elected in 2021. She is the formal tribal attorney uh, for the Bay Mills Indian Community and the successor to our distinguished uh, Assistant Secretary, uh, Brian Newland, who was uh, the chairman or president before uh, Ms. Gravel. Uh, finally, and, and not least, is uh, our uh, uh, person from the Great Land, Chief P.J. Simon from Tanana Chiefs Conference in Alaska. Uh, he was elected as the chief of the Tanana Chiefs Conference in, in 2020. Uh, he works on all manner of issues involving uh, public safety, broadband, food security, you name it, uh, as well as climate change. Uh, he lives in Fairbanks, Alaska, and is a tribal member from Alakakit uh, and Galena. So I'm going to uh, begin with a, a, a focus question, uh, and I'm going to start out with uh, Chair Janet Davis. And so uh, Chair uh, Davis, um, question we discussed in, in getting ready was, uh, uh, how can the Biden-Harris administration better support public safety and justice in Indian country? So why don't you take a few minutes and uh, address that uh, question? And uh, I don't see Chair... Uh, Davis on there. All right, then we're going to go right on down to President Gravel. We're having some technical difficulties with Chair Davis. So, uh, President Gravel, uh, can you answer that question? Give us of your course. Ani Bojo, Giwede uh, Nagabo, Gwen Dishnikaz, Ganush Nakani Nindonjaba, Chi Miigwech, and thank you, Bob, uh, for having me be part of this panel. Uh, the biggest thing that I believe tribal nations need uh, and want for justice and public safety in Indian country is empowerment. Uh, we must empower our tribal nations with the ability and resources to allow them to adequately prosecute, punish, investigate the crimes committed against our people on our land, as well as rehabilitate, heal, and strengthen our own tribal citizens who are suffering from centuries of intergenerational trauma. Yet, as you've clearly articulated, improving safety in the day-to-day -day lives of residents in Indian country is the responsibility of a broad range of justice institutions, both within and outside of Indian country. Improving safety necessitates the involvement of social services, public health providers, tribal and non-tribal policymakers, federal and state officials, and the residents of tribal communities, among others. If we want comprehensive improvement of public safety in Indian country, we must work together. Having said all of this, uh, and although there is a lot of focus on law enforcement, my main recommendation is the element of cooperation through the execution of more broad and encompassing deputation agreements with tribal nations, as well as memorandums of understandings with other federal agencies that allow tribal nations to take enforcement action on various lands. We know that there is a lack of resources, not only for tribal nations, but also the federal government when it comes to exercising jurisdiction in Indian country. We know there are very little FBI resources, investigative training, and communication or database, database systems for information sharing. Yet little is done to combine these forces to allow for a full comprehensive protection of tribal nations across the country. 
by providing a more permanent base funding to tribal courts and law enforcement departments, we can actually work together to provide the safety that Indian country is looking for. For example, at, for a, a consideration of a, a memorandum of understanding or cross deputation agreement, many tribal nations are surrounded by thousands of acres of national forest lands and federal lands. Yet the Special Law Enforcement Commission cross-deputation agreements typically limit the exercise of federal enforcement mechanisms by tribal law enforcement to Indian lands or Indian country. However, we know that boundaries do not stop crimes and that barriers are invisible as we conduct ourselves. So when a crime occurs on federal land or national forest land directly adjacent to tribal reservations, tribal law enforcement officers have no authority. This applies not only to crimes, but also to the looting of sacred sites, burial grounds, and the taking of sacred items. We're going to talk a lot today about protection against violence being committed against our people presently, but it's also extremely important to protect against violence being committed against our ancestors. They have suffered long and well enough, and they, in their final acts of resting, do not deserve any more violence. In instances like I've described, allowing deputation agreements or memorandums of understanding to encompass more and address various types of crimes will strengthen cooperation between tribal, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. I also saw today that the Secretary of the Department of Interior, as well as the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, signed an order, order to strengthen tribal co-stewardship of public lands and waters, and I am so grateful that tribal nations will be included in that work. But that stewardship should also include law enforcement measures so that we can also protect our stewardship of those lands as well. So miigwech. Thank you, President Gravel. Well, I see that uh, Chair Davis's picture is back up on the screen here. And uh, you know, one thing we know is that we do need broadband improvements in, in Indian country. And this is a graphic example of that. So I'm going to try again with uh, Chair Davis and, and ask the question about, you know, what can the administration do to better support public safety and justice in Indian country. Uh, so, uh, 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 Chair Davis, if, I hope you're there. Uh, uh, if you could address that question, it'd be awesome. And I'm being met with a, uh, a picture of uh, Chair Davis. So, I'm gonna switch over to uh, uh, Chief Simon here uh, to uh, address the question. Chief, uh, uh, tell us uh, what's happening in Alaska and uh, how you think we could improve things uh, from the administration's uh, perspective in terms of uh, justice support. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And thank, thank all of you guys for what you do for Indian country. It's really important that uh, what's going on now with the Biden-Harris administration and all of our collective efforts up here in Alaska. By the way, it's 11 below zero dead air Fahrenheit and uh, negative. But we live in a really tough country up here in Alaska, especially in the interior. It's one thing to remember, it's we have our tribal governments and tribal villages out there in rural Alaska, and it's very difficult to deliver a high level of service in an unstandard fashion to remote location. And when we talk about law and order, public safety, that, that for me and our tribal leaders is the number one issue we need, we need public safety in our villages. We need a, a functioning tribal court. We also need law and order through the TPO or VPO or the state assisted village public safety officer. So we have a public safety crisis in Alaska right now. We need to address law enforcement. We need to bolster our tribal court and keep in mind when Troy Eide with the Indian Law and Order Commission was our keynote speaker at the Tanana Chiefs Conference, one of the takeaways it was it takes seven years to make a difference. And you can't just change our people or all American Indians or Alaska Natives overnight. So, you know, uh, Alaska Native women were overrepresented in, in domestic violence, 250%. 47% of reported rape victims in the state of Alaska. That's just reported. We have a public safety crisis that needs to be addressed. And regardless of land title, our tribes here have 
inherent civil and criminal jurisdiction over all Alaska Natives present in their villages. We have authority by tribal governments. We're sovereign tribes. We must have federal legislation that recognize Indian tribes in Alaska that have full juris civil jurisdiction within their villages to ensure and enforce protect protection orders involving any individual will create funding opportunities for law enforcement and tribal justice program. In short, we need law and order in our villages. Without law and order, we'll have high rates of domestic violence, we'll have suicide, that we have uh, some areas, a epidemic of methamphetamine, heroin, alcohol. We're going to the second winter of COVID and it, it's something that I think this panel can address on a go forward is we need civil law and order. We need tribal law and order. Uh, one thing that really ties in, I think, with the takeaway is protection of our traditional foods, which will feed our soul, make our people feel better out there in our tribal homelands. Once we can consume our traditional foods, it'll make us better gives us the spirituality and connectivity to our lands. But again, we need law and order. We need a functioning tribal TPO program, tribal uh, peace officer program, or a village public safety officer. But we do need a functioning tribal court. One will not work without the other. And when William Barr visited a few years ago, we came away with $11 million. So that, that, that was a good start, but we do need more help out here. Education, education. The greatest predictor of an adult's health is a quality education. And the panel before talked about education. I think it's really important that we have uh, education and making permanent recurring funding for tribal courts just Make it permanent. We need all the help we can get out there in Indian country in empowering our tribes to govern their public safety and also with the government providing funding for these programs would really bolster a public safety and justice in our villages. Thank you, Chief Simon. I'm going to turn to so I'm going to seize the opportunity. Uh, Chair Davis, can you uh, talk to us a bit about your views on uh, uh, support for public safety and justice in Indian country? Sure. Um, I'm going to start out by telling, telling a little um, story here. Um, Pyramid Lake Police responded to an emergency call shortly after midnight on December 15, 2020 at a home here in Nixon. The d victim identified by the Washoe County Regional Medical Examiner's Office was Amanda Davis, 37 years old. She was found with multiple stab wounds. Davis was an enrolled member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. The problem with this case, this terrible and horrific case, was that Amanda was my niece. To make matters worse, this murder was committed in the presence of her three children right before Christmas with a Christmas tree and presents in the home. Amanda did her best to provide for her children. After she was murdered and her children traumatized for life, her body laid in, ho in her home and in her blood for 20 hours, 20 hours. Her mother, tribal relatives, clergy, weren't allowed in the home or near the body for over 20 hours. Would this have been allowed 45 miles away in Reno, Nevada? Why was this allowed on our reservation? The murderer returned to the home and was arrested and transported to a hospital by ambulance. He reportedly told officers that the victim was pregnant with his child. A local Re Reno newspaper reported that Native Americans face particularly high rates of violence, including intimate partner violence. To increase public safety at tribal communities within Nevada, our office helped launch the MMIP initiative last year, said U.S. Attorney Truchanich. In a statement provided to KOLO 8 News Now, because combating domestic violence is a top priority to KOLA 8 News Now, um, is a top priority. Our prosecutors were able to work with our law enforcement partners to take swift action here, filing preliminary charges within hours. And we have continued to coordinate in the investigation of this case. Well, there was no swift action. 
taken on this case. I reached out to the Nevada Indian Commission and further to Senator Cortez Mastel's office looking for some action. In this case, we are all helpless in getting action. On December 18, 2020, U.S. Attorney for the District of Nevada, Nicholas Tritanet, announced a charge of second degree murder within Indian country against Michael Bursiaga, 33. Major felonies on the Permit Lake Reservation are under the jurisdiction of the FBI. I believe that these offices are understaffed or at least understaffed to deal with major crimes on Indian reservations. If they have the jurisdiction, then they need to deal with all aspects of a crime in a swift manner in order to limit the trauma to the family and community. Assessments need to be done to find out what their limitations are with staffing and resources. Assessments need to be done with the tribes to find out where their limitations are. Do we need to enter into MOAs with the FBI or other law enforcement agencies and court officials to get the ball rolling faster? We need to know and understand the jurisdictional differences in dealing with a tribal versus non-tribal perpetrator. Perhaps we can attribute that the federal government is not set up for domestic crimes in which the FBI investigates the crimes on reservations, colonies, towns in which our tribal people live. Many tribes have the lack of trust of the federal government. This is also an issue in Indian country. Although tribal sovereignty an issue, it might be more expedient to have MOUs with state or county agencies to assist with the cases. Do we want the state district attorney to handle these crimes? There are so many unsolved major crimes in Indian country against women and men. The practice of those being shelved in a cold case file should not be the norm. What can we do better? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Davis. I'm gonna to turn to uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, Lisa Monaco to get her thoughts on this topic and, and react if she, if she feels like it to uh, your eloquent statements. Well, thanks so much, Bob. Um, and let me just say, uh, Chairwoman Davis, President Gravel, Chief Simon, it is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it is particularly a privilege for me to um, be here today to represent the Public Safety and Justice Committee of the White House Council on uh, Native American Affairs that the Department of Justice uh, chairs along with Secretary Holland and the uh, Department of Interior. Uh, and I really appreciate the perspectives that we've heard thus far uh, that have already been offered uh, on ways this administration and the Justice Department in particular can better support public safety in Native communities. I wanna say in, in particular uh, to uh, Chairwoman Davis, I wanna express my sincere condolences uh, on uh, the loss of your niece. Obviously, uh, the type of violence that you've just described um, hits Native uh, communities and Native women uh, much too hard uh, and uh, in disproportionate fashion. And it's, uh, it is a theme uh, that unfortunately I think we will come back to again and again uh, in this afternoon's discussion. Uh, and it is a particular priority for the Attorney General and myself as I'll talk about, particularly when we talk about the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization, including the expansion of the special uh, domestic violence jurisdiction that we're pursuing in that law. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, I know we will discuss more specifics like that on this panel, but the main message that I really want to take time to convey today is that the Justice Department is committed. Uh, we are committed to partnering with you, with tribes, with tribal communities uh, across the country to improve public safety uh, in tribal communities. We know that the best solutions to public safety challenges in tribal communities are going to come from those communities themselves. We know that each tribe's history and culture is unique and that one solution for one particular tribe may not work for another. That's why the department is working very hard to build on an open dialogue uh, with tribal communities across the country. Since January, since the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration, the Department of Justice has engaged already in six major consultations, more than any prior year, I'm told, uh, and topics have ranged from the Violence Against Women Act to public safety in Oklahoma in particular, as we'll talk about with the McGirt uh, ruling, juvenile justice issues, 
and improving uh, our law enforcement databases and the relevance they can provide to tribal investigations and public safety. Those formal consultations are just one way in which the Department of Justice is maintaining an open dialogue uh, and partnering with tribal communities on a regular basis. We've also uh, been engaged now for a number of years uh, with, of course, the Office of Tribal Justice that was started by my first boss in the Department of Justice, Attorney General Janet Reno. Um, the Department's uh, Office of Tribal Justice meets regularly with the Tribal Nations Leadership Council. That council, I think as known to many of you, provides the department with crucial perspective. Uh, it, it is a great uh, sounding board and um, ability for us to gain uh, a great deal of expertise from tribal representatives uh, and really get some very important uh, perspective on public safety issues and criminal justice issues facing Native communities. Uh, and of course, on a day-to-day -day basis, federal agents are working alongside tribal officers, including on joint task forces like the Safe Trails Task Forces that the FBI has, uh, those task forces targeting violent crime, drug trafficking, uh, and other public safety issues facing Native communities. Uh, the National Indian Country Training Initiative uh, is offering a range of programs to ensure that department prosecutors, as well as tribal, state, local, and territorial criminal justice personnel, receive the training and the support that they need to address challenges that are key to and relevant to investigations and prosecutions in Native communities. And of course, the Office of Violence Against Women supports tribes that are exercising the special domestic violence jurisdiction that I mentioned. We have repeatedly, and I think unfortunately, heard about the major impact that this authority has uh, and that it's had to have had on so many uh, communities. Uh, that's one of the reasons that this important authority uh, is being pushed by the administration and that we've really been pressing Congress to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act and along with it, this increased uh, jurisdiction. Last month, I testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee in the United States Senate uh, to urge the swift passage of the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, including provisions that recognize tribal sovereignty to prosecute crimes that often occur alongside domestic violence, such as child abuse. Now, of course, I've heard already uh, this afternoon, and we'll discuss more during this panel, uh, that the department has got to continue to find new ways to strengthen our partnership with tribes. And one way that we will be doing that is, and I'm pleased uh, to be able to announce this, that we'll be co-hosting the National Tribal Law Enforcement Summit early in 2022, along with, of course, Secretary Holland's leadership in the Department of Interior. That summit will bring together tribal, federal, state, and local law enforcement authorities to share best practices. And as the Attorney General announced earlier today, moving forward, all Senate-confirmed United States attorneys in districts with tribal land, they will meet with and be required to meet with experts at the Department of Justice to learn about the unique tribal justice issues in their jurisdictions, as well as best practices for consulting local tribal governments and members. So those are a few issues I wanna put on the table as we have a further discussion this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing more during the panel about the ways the department can better work with tribes to build and sustain justice systems that both honor <coughs> tribal traditions and meet the specific public safety needs in Native communities. Wonderful, thank you. Now I'm gonna to turn to my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Brian Newland. So Secretary Newland, uh, take it away. Miigwech, uh, thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, first, Chair Davis, um, I'm so sorry for your family and your niece and your great nieces and nephews um, for what happened uh, to them and to your, your community last Christmas. And I think as everybody here knows, um, that's unfortunately too common in Indian country, and that's not acceptable. Um, it's not acceptable to Indian country, it's not acceptable to the Attorney General and, and the Secretary, and it's not acceptable to the President. And we are working hard to um, make sure that 
we're working with in collaboration with Indian country uh, so that tribes have the tools to prevent that uh, those types of crimes from happening. Um, Chief Simon had mentioned uh, that the number one priority in Indian country was um, public safety and law enforcement. And, and since I've come into this role uh, this year, um, I've heard that consistently in my conversations with tribal leaders. Even when we're meeting on, on topics that have nothing to do with law enforcement, it comes up. Um, Indian country wants uh, good policing in tribal communities for public safety. And in concert with that, we have to have good tribal courts um, uh, to match with good policing in tribal communities. And I know that's a particular challenge for the more than 240 tribes in Alaska um, who are remote and under-resourced. Um, in next year's budget request, President Biden has requested a 15% increase, excuse me, a 13% increase in funding for public safety and justice at the Department of the Interior. Uh, that will fund 191 tribal law enforcement programs and 96 corrections programs uh, serving more than 227 tribes. Uh, that budget request also includes an 11% increase in funding for tribal courts. And tribal courts, even in states with, uh, uh, that are pub or public law 280 states where tribes don't have full criminal jurisdiction over crimes uh, committed on tribal lands, tribal courts are very innovative in finding ways to bring healing to communities, um, to break these cycles of violence and addiction and abuse in communities. And um, I've been very excited to see some of the innovative ways that tribal courts have done that through healing to wellness courts and uh, treatment courts and mental health courts. Um, so these are the types of things that uh, you know we're gonna continue to focus on here under President Biden's leadership because none of what you've described um, Chair Davis is, uh, should ever be acceptable in this country. Miwich, Secretary. Let's, uh, let's move on here uh, to uh, uh, Chief Simon. Uh, and Chief Simon, I'm wondering if you could take a few minutes to talk about some of the best practices or, or models that you uh, think might be out there uh, that other tribes might utilize uh, to uh, improve uh, community engagement, improve public safety in, in tribal courts uh, in your community. So uh, take it away. Yes, thank you, Mr. Solicitor. Uh, Alaska and tribes have the ability to sign tribal uh, state civil diversion agreements to divert misdemeanor crimes from state court to tribal court for restorative sentencing. Uh, you know, it, it's really, it's really up to the tribes, like I heard the uh, leadership talk about. But one thing with the tribes, they say, leave it up to us. But when we're asking, whether it's the state government or other federal agencies, is they tell us to come up with our own, uh, our own housing, holding cell, offices, and just starting from a big goose egg, a zero in you know, building it up with the wonderful team here we have at Canada Chiefs Conference is we all want, we love our people. We want them to, to really prosper, to really reach their full potential. But we need extra funding for the holding cells, for infrastructure, for law and order. It's just not there right now. When we talk about trying to deliver a high level of service in a non-standard fashion to a remote location is very challenging. And what, what we can encompass on the go forward is working together with the, the federal government coming in. And the team here are really passionate. They put together really technical, complex programs that's going to work out there. So they're trying hard. I think meeting us more than halfway on our, a lot of our programs will really enhance uh, tribal government uh, law and order out there, which will protect our elders, our children, our women uh, against domestic violence. Uh, it'll slow down contraband, methamphetamine going to our villages, heroin, alcohol. It'll also it'll also help our people with with guidance. And once we're healthy, and I'll say again, protection of our traditional foods, tra traditional homelands, adds on to that uh, safety 
aspect as, as mental wellness. So behavioral health is also a huge factor, especially in the dark days right now where we're losing four to six minutes of light. It, we really need to, to focus on uh, the programs that we have and enhance what the, the Biden-Harris administration, Department of Interior, uh, Department of Justice wants to work with us, uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Simon. Now I'm going to turn to uh, Chair Davis and ask her to address the same question. Okay, I'm going to touch on um, what Chief Simon has said to you all. Um, and in order for us to have best practices or models for public safety, for justice for our tribes and our communities, we need funding. That's the bottom line. Um, I'm going to give an example. I'm sure, you know, he has a better example being in Alaska and all the land base that they cover. But here's an example of our reservation. We are 750 square miles and it stretches over three communities, 15 miles apart. We have a mountain, we have a lake area, and it's more like a small county size. We are funded from BIA 638 contract for $600,000 a year where we should be actually funded up to two to 2.5 million a year for the, all the land base and the population it encompasses. We should be able to fund up to 15 or 18 staff for our size on the reservation and population. We have programs such as social services, court working in conjunction, serving our memberships. They also need the funding as well. We are told to apply for grants. A lot of the time, the grants are time consuming and hard to apply for. With our funding being in inadequate, rather than apply, and we know there's funding available, why can't the tribes just receive the funding? You know, why, why do we have to write grants to, to try to um, be able to use it so we could use it for our communities to be safe? I will give you another example. In Reno, which is a nearby city, we have the Veterans Administration. It is located on one city block. They have a few offices within that block in their hospital. The Veterans Administration has a police department assigned to it for that city block. That department has 25 to 30 people. There is an inequity funding given what is the difference in funding for tribal programs versus other entities? So as I said before, we need funding, funding and more funding. Funding can provide tribes the training needed to have a successful community engagement model. So just piggybacking on what Chief Simon said. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Chair Davis. Uh, now I'm going to turn to a uh, topic that's been, you know, in the news. It's, it's been touched on in our discussion. Uh, Secretary Holland has been very active along with the White House uh, in terms of uh, 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 legislation and uh, uh, administrative actions to address the question of missing and murdered indigenous persons. Uh, and the question I'll put uh, to uh, first to Deputy Attorney General Monaco is, um, you know, how can the uh, administration do more work in this area to be, to be helpful uh, to the people who are, are missing and also to uh, the tribes that are uh, trying to keep their people safe? Well, thanks, Bob. Um, I'll try and respond to that and also um, uh, hit upon a, some of the themes that we've already heard, in particular from Chief Simon and just now from, from Chair Davis. Uh, on the funding piece, you're quite right. Um, the, the tribal efforts in law enforcement uh, and training and assistance and in victim services need more support, uh, which is why the Justice Department this year will make available more than $200 million in grants to support public safety in, in Indian country. Um, but I hear uh, the message loud and clear uh, that more is needed. Uh, and on your uh, question, Bob, on missing or murdered uh, indigenous persons, unfortunately that's a theme uh, along with violence against women in, in Native communities is, is a theme uh, that we're hearing over and over uh, in these conversations. And, you know, Chief Simon, uh, knowing that four in five Native women in Alaska suffer from domestic violence or experience sexual assault uh, is just a stunning uh, and 
uh, really sobering number. And when you think, uh, as we know from the data, that those crimes are so often a precursor to cases of missing and murdered uh, indigenous women, um, that is even more sobering. So what can we do? The Justice Department uh, has made uh, this issue a, a very significant priority to address the high rates of violence against indigenous persons uh, and, of course, the high rates of people reported missing from native communities themselves. Uh, in late 2020, of course, Congress took an important step to address this crisis through the passage of Savannah's Act uh, and the Not Invisible Act, thanks, of course, to the incredible leadership of uh, Secretary, then Congresswoman Holland, um, and her leadership on those bills in particular and on this issue in particular. Um, since the Attorney General and I have come into office, the Justice Department has been committed to fully implementing those two laws. Our partnerships with tribes are at the forefront of that particular work. And in recent months, the department has met uh, repeatedly with tribal leaders, tribal representatives, and tribal organizations to better understand the issues facing uh, their communities. And during those conversations, uh, several themes have emerged. First, we've repeatedly heard about the importance tribal leadership uh, has on the approach uh, in combating this crisis. That's why over the past nine months, uh, the U.S. Attorney's offices have encouraged the development of tribal community response plans. These plans require substantive engagement led by tribes in establishing local protocols for handling missing person cases in a way that respects the voices and the views of victims and their families. More than 20 tribes have started developing tribal community response plans. And here, of course, I should uh, do a particular shout out to President Gravel, who was instrumental in developing one of this country's very first tribal community response plans. Uh, and many thanks to you for being willing to share that plan as a model with other tribes. We've also heard from tribal members and groups about the importance of better data collection uh, and information sharing to address reports of missing persons as well as violent crimes against Native people. The FBI has made some adjustments in its own violent crime reporting in response to feedback, and we're in the process of rolling out new training and technical assistance programs when it comes uh, to data. Earlier this fall, we also announced the expansion of the Tribal Access Program, which gives participating tribes direct access to national crime information databases, and we are looking forward to continuing that expansion, to expand further participation in what I think is a very, very important program. And also for years, the department has heard from tribal leaders with concerns about gender-based violence, and I've hit upon this already this afternoon. It's too often a precursor uh, when we ultimately resolve missing persons cases or homicides. And so, as I mentioned, the department has pushed Congress to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, including recognizing tribal sovereignty to prosecute crimes that often occur alongside domestic violence. And in the fiscal year 2022 budget, the president has requested $46 million for the department's Office of Violence Against Women and the tribal-specific grant programs uh, that are done by that office. Um, now, those are all steps, I think, that are in the right direction, as we've uh, heard, but there's more that I think we can do to confront what is, I think, an unacceptable reality when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous persons. Earlier today, of course, the president signed a new executive order, which dictates, dictates some of the important steps that this administration will be taking in this area. The new executive order reflects that broader public safety concerns behind missing and murdered indigenous persons and the statistics around this issue, they demand a holistic, whole of government approach to the problem. So the department looks forward to continuing to work across the government, including, of course, with our partners at the Department of Interior to implement the executive order. And one of the things that I am doing today is launching a steering committee inside the Department of Justice, which will have representatives from across the department 
Um, and that committee will coordinate the department's ongoing work in the area of missing and murdered indigenous persons, including reviewing our current policies and practices to see what changes are needed to better combat uh, what is frankly uh, a crisis when it comes to the MMIP issue. I'm directing the steering committee to work closely with tribes in developing policy changes, and I look forward to hearing more uh, about what you think we should be doing in this regard and to partnering with tribes across the country to help bring answers uh, and frankly, to help bring justice to grieving communities. Thank you, uh, Deputy Attorney General Monaco. Uh, indeed, it was a great uh, thing this morning to, to listen to the secretary and watch her introduce the president and have him uh, sign that uh, executive order. It was really uh, uh, an important uh, event and uh, substantively, uh, I think it'll make a lot of difference uh, going forward. Now, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Newland, uh, I know you've done a lot of thinking about this and working in the area, so uh, give us your thoughts, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bob. And, and Deputy Attorney General, I, I appreciate you um, highlighting the executive order today. Um, I think that's a, that's a great uh, foundation for us to build upon uh, going forward in the rest of the administration in partnership with Indian Country. It really directs us all to coordinate our efforts with one another, and that's one of the biggest uh, challenges Indian country faces when it comes to missing persons um, because uh, you know, many people live in their tribal communities and, and then um, they might be visiting a relative uh, in, in an urban area off the res and uh, then they go missing from there and, and it creates just a, a jurisdictional nightmare for law enforcement agencies to start working and they're um, you, know, you lose valuable time in trying to solve these cases. So that coordination between tribal and local and state and federal law enforcement agencies is absolutely crucial. And the executive order the president signed today uh, directs us to do that. Um, here at the Department of the Interior, Secretary Holland has been uh, a passionate and forceful uh, leader on this and an advocate for us to do something. Uh, she established the missing and murdered unit within the BIA earlier this year. And uh, that unit is, allows us to coordinate our BIA law enforcement officers across the country on new missing persons cases so that we can respond quickly and coordinate with other agencies. And in the uh, FY22 budget request that the president has submitted to Congress, uh, we've asked for increased funding for the missing and murdered unit within the BIA that will nearly double uh, the staff uh, within that unit, uh, which will really bolster our ability to uh, respond to these cases. And, and the, the last piece that I want to mention right now is just how important it is for us to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act um, and uh, you know, get those extra tools uh, that we need in the hands of uh, tribal law enforcement and tribal courts to solve these cases at the local level and um, you know, where these cases originate. So that, that coordination across federal agencies, uh, that coordination between federal agencies and with tribal governments, and then state and local agencies, and then the funding to go with that, it, uh, it, all under the direction of the president and the executive order he signed today is a really good place for us to start. Great. Thank you, uh, Assistant Secretary Newland. Uh, President Gravel, you've got deep experience in this uh, arena. Why don't you share some of your thoughts with us? Uh, miigwech. I just want to say miigwech again to Assistant Secretary Newland and Deputy Attorney General Monaco uh, for their remarks. I agree that when we are addressing the missing and murdered indigenous peoples issues in Indian country, we must not only fix what happens after a case is reported, um, but also fix what happens uh, and take it upon ourselves to resolve what happens before we lose our loved ones. When a case is reported um, behind it, I see failures, uh, failures to stop instances of domestic violence, failures to provide safe houses for partners in abusive relationships, failures to provide legal protection for our two-spirit relatives, uh, failures to provide services for emotional abuse, um, failures at communication and cooperation. And when Bay Mills Indian community, uh, you know, engaged in our comprehensive uh, community response plan on missing and murdered indigenous peoples, one of the things we learned in preparation of that plan was to ask questions, not only of ourselves, 
um, but our nearby law enforcement partners. And we learned that we needed to communicate our expectations on sharing information and how we were going to collaborate with one another. We also learned that it was extremely important that we take steps beforehand uh, implementing policy or regulatory frameworks to stop those failures, to stop those steps that led to the final and horrific acts uh, that take our loved ones. This includes that we have an implementation of human rights or elements of human security in all aspects that touch Indian country. And one of those that we often forget about because we're so focused on those jurisdictional issues are aspects of business and other industry that touch us. That can include business industries uh, like our casinos uh, where tribal nations are targeted to be used for human trafficking or regulatory protections for women and men against extractive industries because business practices affect all portions of human rights, that can include the right to a clean environment, personal security, community security, and economic stability. It is incumbent upon us that we observe the impacts of those business practices and what they're doing to our communities. Without adherence to human rights standards in our business standards, uh, development projects uh, can lead to violence and conflict. The most vulnerable or mar marginalized members of our communities often bear the brunt uh, of negative social impacts, which means like Chair Davis and Chair Simon have said, it is disproportionately impacting Indian country and it is disproportionately impacting our women. When we look at extractive industries like pipeline projects, such as Line 3, which resulted in two arrests of employees of Enbridge Energy, or future projects like the proposed tunnel for Line 5, or other extractive practices across Indian country, it's important we ask ourselves before any extractive or other business practice takes place, will the size and the scope of the project um, include large transient groups that are coming into the area Will the development of the project occur in a rural location nearby our tribal nations? And do we live and work and practice and are part of that surrounding project area? Uh, in order to develop any region in Indian country, like we learned in our comprehensive community plan, it is important to not only ask these questions, but acknowledge that other industries outside of our control are going to have an impact on our tribal nations. And so it's even more important that we develop regulatory frameworks, communication and data sharing that is implemented into these business industry practices so that this harm is no, no longer inflicted on our people. I would greatly recommend that as you know, the Department of Justice and the Department of Interior continue their good work in addressing the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, that we also implement a study of how to deal with business industries or extractive industries and that should be taken into consideration by the Not Invisible Act Commission and be part of the committee's final recommendations. We must broaden our scope and ensure that not only are we able to serve justice within our own communities, but that we're also protecting that justice um, from outside harm, outside business, and other outside influences. Miigwech. Thank you, President Gravel. Uh, we've got time left for, for one question uh, from the audience, and so I'm going to call on uh, Governor Michael Chavaria from uh, Santa Clara Pueblo uh, to read his question and then we'll have uh, the Deputy Attorney General and Assistant Secretary both respond to uh, your question. So I trust our technical folks have this uh, under control. All right. Uh, you hear me all right? Thumbs up? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, out of respect and a good afternoon in my table language, you know, unfortunately, substance and alcohol abuse still plagues us. Incarceration is not always the answer. We need uh, secure treatment facilities that provide culturally sensitive behavioral health, deal diagnosis, treatment and counseling programs for every offender. Secure facilities are needed for violent, convicted substance abuse offenders so that they cannot walk away from the education, treatment and counseling while the community, community can be safe, while the offenders modify their behavior, uh, beds and inpatient long-term facilities are not currently available. We need more. Detox facilities are immediately, uh, placement for substance abuse is also badly needed. 
you know, we have learned long-term education, treatment, and counseling programs have proven, have proven to be more successful in modifying addictive behavior than short-term behavior modification programs. Unfortunately for us, in 2016, the Pueblos and other Southwest tribes and nations lost the service of the San Luis Regional Detention and Support Center's Turning Point Program, which offered a secure facility with a culturally sensitive education, treatment, and counseling dual diagnosis program. The program con conducted in the secure facility has not been replaced. So my question is, how will the administration work with the public to support solutions that centers around the overall, overall wellness of our public people to include the proper behavioral health programs, treatments, new diagnosis, to include education through workforce development, through secure long-term facilities? I uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Good luck. Thank you. Well, Attorney General uh, Monaco, you've got a, a, a minute or so to provide the answer to that. Uh, uh, great question, so sure. take it away. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you, Governor, um, for asking the question, because uh, it's really, really important that you um, have done so because it puts a spotlight on what is uh, an all too present um, theme that we're hearing, uh, in particular from rural communities, and I know, of course, as you've mentioned, uh, from tribal communities, but the, the challenge of um, addiction, substance abuse, I know I hear often from public safety leaders about opioid, uh, the opioid crisis. I think at bottom, what this conversation reflects is this is, of course, a public safety crisis, but it's a public health crisis, and we need to approach it uh, in that fashion. Uh, and the consequences we've got to recognize, and we have to have responses that recognize the consequences of these, this kind of dual crisis, uh, is that it impacts, of course, the individual who is suffering from and struggling with substance abuse, um, but it goes beyond that and impacts that individual's family and the broader uh, community. And so we've got to have an approach that reflects that. So what are we doing? The department is uh, focusing its grant efforts uh, on these issues, supporting the development of culturally relevant justice systems, treatment, recovery, prevention options uh, in those systems. Um, that are working uh, for particular communities. Um, and you know that's got to include, I think, as your question suggests, in-house treatment centers uh, that are secure, that are appropriate, and that are effective. This year, I'm glad to say the department will award almost $8 million as part of its tribal justice systems infrastructure program. Um, and those are funds that can be used for construction of the types of treatment facilities that I just mentioned in, the, in tribal justice systems. Uh, we'll also award $7 million in funding for tribes uh, to implement uh, healing uh, to wellness courts. Uh, those would respond in particular to alcohol and substance abuse issues, including opioid um, uh, use and abuse amongst adults and uh, juveniles. But the bottom line is I think we've got to treat this as a public safety and a public health issue. Thank you. Assistant Secretary Newland. Thanks, Governor Cheveria. It's great to see you again. And, you know, we could probably have a, a, a summit just on this issue. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, just very quickly, um, the Deputy Attorney General is, is right that the, the effects of addiction are far reaching and they are public health um, issues and, and not just public safety issues. Uh, so we have to respond um, just that way. Um, one of the ways we can do that is by continuing to support wellness courts and treatment courts in, in tribal communities and, and make sure that tribes are designing those courts uh, to match their resources and local needs. Um, and uh, at the Department of the Interior, we are uh, working to expand the Tawahi Initiative um, uh, from a pilot program and make it more accessible to tribes across the country. Uh, the Tawahi Initiative uh, involves um, customizing uh, those social services and justice uh, programs at the tribal level to meet uh, your needs. Um, and again, to, to um, use your, your cultural knowledge, the resources you have in your community um, to address the problems uh, that people are facing in your community and really just be collaborative and supportive uh, from the Department of the Interior standpoint to tribal efforts to do that. Great, 
Thank you, Assistant Secretary. Uh, well, we've got uh, uh, just a few minutes left, so let's uh, have our tribal leader panelists uh, uh, wrap it up with uh, some closing thoughts that, that you might have. Uh, Chair Davis, we'll start with you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak on this very important um, panel address addressing issues in Indian country. In closing, I would like to reiterate that there is the need to have consistency in dealing with major crimes on Indian reservations. Assessments need to be done to determine what our limitations are with staffing and resources. Um, do we individual tribes need to work closely with nearby agencies to expedite, expedite the process, um, such as um, county and state? All tribes need funding to assist our tribal courts and tribal public safety offices. Um, I believe we are moving forward as evidenced by all present at this summit discussing this issue today. And just Pija you, thank you. Great. President Gravel. Miigwech for the invite to be on this panel, as well as to Assistant Secretary Newland and Deputy Attorney General Monaco for their words today and their work that they're going to continue to do. Uh, in hearing the words of our tribal leaders today, I am reminded that violence is not our heritage. Uh, violence is not our way of life. Um, however, what is part of our teachings is our, our grandfather teachings, wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, uh, humility and truth. And I truly believe that by continuing to follow these teachings and in integrate them into our public safety systems, we will be able to take steps forward that heal uh, the intergenerational traumas that plague our tribal communities and that are found in our tribal court systems. So thank you again. And I look forward to continuing the work with our federal partners on bringing restorative justice to Indian country. Miigwech. Miigwech to you. Uh, Chief Simon, Yes, thank you all for the invite for this really important panel. Again, it's a public safety crisis here in rural Alaska. You heard uh, continued support for VAWA. And also with the Violence Against Women Act, you know, we've got to do something for our native men in our, our Alaska villages. If we leave them out of the equation, most of the time they're the, they're the people that's committing the act. And it all ties into law and order, uh, we, tribal courts, but also another thing to remember, trying to deliver that high level of service to, in an unstandard fashion to remote location is really challenging. And remember, the first chief, the president in all of our villages, sometimes they're the first responders. They're the law, they're the counselor at whether it's two in the morning, six in the morning, the elected leadership all always the first responders. If we can get more funding to provide law and order, that would really, really help us out. Criminal reentry. Once our, uh, our our enrollees are incarcerated because of the, the effects of alcohol and drugs or having no law, we need to have a system in place for criminal reentry. And again, you know, without law, without without tribal court. You know, as a first chief, as a five years of a first chief, I gave CPR to a deceased person with a massive heart attack for a few hours. Uh, January 26, 2017, without the cooperation of law and state law, I banished four people giving meth to young girls in the village. I put my life on the line to protect our young girls from uh, in, in, in the trades. Uh, getting recruited. So it's a really imperative. We need to fund the programs that will make our villages up here in Alaska safer, make our elders safer. Our kids can look at us in the eye and know that we got their back, that we're taking care of them. And it's, it's with help from the Biden-Harris team, Secretary Holland, you guys there at the Department of Justice. So in closing remarks, just remember still yet right now, a lot of our presidents and chiefs in the villages, they're the law and order right now. So please, you know, keep that in mind. Um, criminal reentry is really big and uh, cultural identity, a lot of that. So thank you all for allowing, allowing me to be part of this and panel. Okay. 
Well, that's great, uh, Chief Simon. Uh, I want to thank uh, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco for joining us. I know you're really busy, and it's really great to see uh, such a high-level official at this uh, very important uh, uh, meeting that we're having today. And likewise, uh, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Newland, uh, it's great to uh, have you uh, uh, on stage with our, our great, our wonderful tribal tribal leaders, uh, Chair Davis. Uh, President Gravel and, and Chief Simon. Uh, all of this information is going to be used by the uh, White House uh, Committee on uh, or Conference on Native American Affairs uh, in developing uh, the administration's agenda going forward uh, and in our national policy development. Uh, and of course, I want to thank President Biden for hosting this very important summit. And I'm really glad that this panel uh, was uh, uh, a big part of it. Uh, everyone deserves to be safe, and we're all working toward that end. Uh, so thank you all, uh, and uh, uh, we're, out, we're, out, we're done for today. Bye. Thank you.